Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have an update on my long-term project to understand the evolution of hand-knit socks and stockings. And I'll share five more breeds in my hand-spinning and knitting breed study. So let's get started. This tidbit is an article that appeared in the New York Times last week. The headline is, Knitters Say Stitching Helps Them Follow the Thread in Meetings. And one of the first paragraphs says, Recently, a county councillor in Wales was accused by a colleague on Twitter of bringing the body into disrepute for knitting during a virtual public meeting. The criticism has touched off a debate about whether it is appropriate to pull out knitting needles in video huddles. The article goes on to say that unlike picking up your phone and scrolling through your social media feed during a meeting, which can distract you from paying attention, knitting can actually have the opposite effect. Occupying your hands doing something repetitive helps many people maintain their focus in meetings. Now, whether or not it's distracting to other people in the meetings might be a different question, but I'll leave a link down in the show notes to the article. There shouldn't be a problem with a paywall issue for this link, even if you're not a subscriber. This tidbit comes from Elizabeth, who's a member of our Locals Knitter Guild and Weavers Guild and she is a fellow spinner. So she shared a series of blog posts that I think I may have shared at least partially previously, but I'm not 100% sure. If I did, it was a good couple of years ago. The blog itself is called A Collection of Unmitigated Pedantry, which is subtitled A Look at History and Popular Culture. So the post that Elizabeth shared is called Clothing, How Did They Make It? The, it's a series of five uh, blog posts. And the first post is a focus on fiber and specifically the two fibers used predominantly in the Mediterranean. So Europe, North Africa, and the Near East. And we're talking historically. And those two fibers are flax, which makes linen, and wool. I'll share the link uh, to the first blog post down in the show notes, and then you will be able to get to the subsequent ones from there. Just to give you an idea about what other posts are in this series on clothing, um, there's information on spinning and weaving and dyeing, all kinds of textile related things that you may be interested in. This tidbit came to me from Rhea. It's an article about knitting through grief. Now, this is a topic that does come up on my channel. Uh, occasionally, I did a Casual Friday segment on knitting through grief um, about a year ago, right after my mother died, um, talking about how I coped with my grief in my knitting. And a lot of viewers shared their experiences with knitting while grieving or during times of other stresses. I think a lot of us who are regular knitters will notice a change in how or what we knit during these times. And the, but the article that Rhea sent has a bit of a different angle. The writer talks about how she turns to knitting during times of grief using simple stitches and the repetition of something like garter stitch in a really meditative way and how helpful that is to her. What I thought was interesting is that she isn't a knitter typically outside of using it through for the grieving process. Uh, one of the things that I have wondered about the pandemic is how it changed people's knitting lives temporarily versus permanently. I noticed it in that first year in 2020, I definitely needed to knit, but the kinds of things that I knit were a bit different, particularly at first. And that over the course of the year, I found that I had knit quite a bit less in total than previous years, although I did knit fairly consistently. But other people noted that they completely stopped knitting during the pandemic and other people picked up knitting. That's some, a new hobby that they started during the pandemic. And I really wonder how many of the people who put their knitting to the side have picked it up again. But I also wonder about those new knitters. Did they acquire a craft for life 
or was it just something they picked up temporarily, like baking sourdough bread was for so many people? Do they not have the time to knit now, or is knitting just a reminder to them of those early months that they don't want to face again? I, you know, I don't know the answer to any of these questions. If some of you have any insight in, into how it's affected you personally, please leave them down in the comments. I imagine that there are academics out there somewhere who are researching this sort of, of thing, not just about knitting specifically, but about other hobbies and pastimes as well during the past few years. Um, but I will leave a link down to the, to the article that Rhea shared. Um, I'll leave a link in the show notes. This tidbit came to me from Charlotte on Ravelry. It's an article about two machines used in the production of yarn. Each of these two machines are the oldest of their kind in the world, and both are housed in the uh, Museum of Industry in Ghent, Belgium. The article is in Dutch, but if you use like Google Chrome, and I imagine other browsers are the same, the article will be translated into English. So. The translation was not written by a human, so there might be a little confusion. I, there was a few things I was uncertain about, but you should be able to get the, the gist. In the English translation, the article says that the machines are a mule jenny, an English spinning machine, and a twine mullen, a device that entangles the yarn. Later, they refer to the twine mullen as a twine mill. The mule jenny is also known as a spinning mule. And I believe that the twine mill is a machine that winds yarn into hanks based on the photo of the machine. Uh, any of you who read Dutch and know something about spinning history, you can please uh, let us know down in the comments. But in order to get some context for what these machines actually did, and also the importance of, of these specific machines that are housed in the Museum of Industry. So if we go back to the 16th century, toward the end of the 16th century, a man named William Lee invented a stocking frame or knitting frame. And he went to Elizabeth I and asked for a patent for this device. Now, the knitting frame could only create stockings that were at about a seven to eight stitches per inch gauge. So these were considered coarse stockings and they would be stockings that common people would wear. They weren't what the fancy people would wear. So Elizabeth I denied his patent because there was this cottage knitting industry that a lot of English people were involved in that involved knitting stockings. And she was afraid that if that industry was shifted to this machine, it would put those people out of work. She might have had a different opinion if it could do really fine gauge knitting like the silk stockings that she and all of the other fancy people in, in Europe like to wear. But she wasn't going to grant him a patent for that. He did eventually um, was able to achieve that really fine gauge, but he was still denied a patent, so he took it to France. So that was the first like big innovation that kind of could speed up the process of making a type of fabric, in this case, knitted fabric. So the flying shuttle, which is something that's used in, in weaving, was invented in 1733. So that doubled weaving efficiency because when uh, a loom was weaving broadcloth that would be really wide. It would take two weavers to throw the shuttle from one end to the other. But the flying shuttle was a device that was hooked on a string and it basically slingshotted the shuttle from one end to the other and allowed one weaver to do this. So you've got a, a way to speed up the production of knitted cloth and woven cloth and the bottleneck is spinning. You have to produce the yarn. So in 1764, 65, a man named James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny, which allowed a single spinner to spin eight on eight spindles at once on the same machine. So at the time, all of this textile work was done in the family home. So entire families were working together to process the fiber, to spin the fiber, to weave it, to knit it, whatever. It was all being done at home. And the spinning jenny could still be done at home. Of course, they wanted to scale this up 
and had even more and more spindles going uh, operating at one time. That led to the invention of what was called the water frame because they realized that because a person couldn't crank um, the wheel that was necessary to spin all of the spindles, a, a huge number of them, uh, they tried horses that didn't work. And so they realized the water wheel would work. I think even if you're a hand spinner, like I'm a hand spinner, I'm not like super, super great at it, but I have been doing it for a few years. Uh, even with some knowledge of hand spinning, it can be really difficult to understand how these machines work when you're looking at drawings or just a, a still machine. And even if it's explained, it can be hard to understand. So I found a YouTube video down below that talks about the spinning Jenny and its inventor, um, James Hargreaves. The video is maybe five or six minutes long, but it gives enough information to get a sense of this first iteration of the invention as well as a demonstration of a more advanced one. I think that one has maybe 16 spindles instead of eight. Uh, and he also talks about how this sort of production moved away from homes and into factories. So the next innovation, the water frame, made an adjustment that allowed the singles that were spun to be created very consistently. Because up till then, with just hand spinning, uh, consistency and really excellent spinning was not the goal, speed was the goal, but now they could get it fast and they could get it consistent. So after the water wheel, or after the water frame comes the spinning mule, which took aspects of each of these two machines, the water frame and the spinning jenny, and combined them together. A mule is a hybrid. We think of it in animals as a horse and a donkey create a mule. In this case, it was two different machines, uh, and they created a mule out of that. So that's the machine that we see in the Museum of Industry in Ghent. So my daughter, Nina, who lives in Amsterdam. Uh, I taught her to knit this past fall. She's gotten very into knitting and, and understanding all of that. She and her fiance, Sam, are taking a bus this weekend down to Ghent, uh, Belgium, for the weekend. And they're one of the things they're planning to do is go to that museum of industry. So I was reading a little bit more about the museum today, and I saw that this particular spinning mule was brought to Ghent back in 1801 by Liefen Bowens, who, it turns out, was an industrial spy. So when these technology innovations were giving an advantage to England, they banned the export of this technology to other countries because they wanted to maintain this advantage. Exporting these machines was not allowed, but he managed to smuggle out the parts uh, of this mule jenny and then bring the industrial revolution to mainland europe i also found another video from an english cotton mill tour that demonstrates sort of the process that would have been going on in the home of carting the cotton spinning it on a single spindle wheel and then uh, how it gets um, moved to the shuttle that's used on the loom and a little bit about the flying shuttle and then showing uh, how the spinning jenny uh, worked. And so you can really kind of see the process. Like uh, uh, you can, I felt like I could understand it better seeing that demonstrate, those two demonstrations and having it pointed out what this machine is doing that would have been done on the wheel. I thought all of this was fascinating. I really thank Charlotte for sending that one little article because it really sent me down a rabbit hole. And I will leave all of those links that I found down in the show notes so that you can go down a rabbit hole as well. This past fall, I wound up my long-term project to understand the evolution of the hand-knit sweater. So that project, I spent four years knitting a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. And then a couple of months later, I started a new project to understand the evolution of socks and stockings. So I wanted to give you an update on what is going on with that long-term project. So the things that I'm really interested in uh, are construction methods and techniques. So that was true of the sweater project. I was choosing my sweaters based on interesting or unusual techniques or 
construction methods I'd never seen before and also the use of techniques that I wasn't familiar with. Um, maybe different versions of techniques than what we would use today. You know, I'm also interested in what sorts of materials and tools and notions might have been used at the time, that sort of thing. Earlier this year, I think it was may have been in January, I shared a tidbit about the story of Gunnister Man, who was discovered in the 1950s, buried in a peat bog near Gunnister on Shetland Island. So there was very little left of Gunnister Man other than some hair inside of his wool hat and a few fingernails inside one of his gloves and maybe a few bone shards. Uh, so he was not there anymore, but his wool clothing was completely intact. Peat bogs are acidic, and wool is acidic, and I imagine that's why it was preserved as well as it was. So I was very interested in re reproducing the Gunnister Man stockings uh, based on the fairly detailed description of the stockings that was published within a few years of his discovery back in the 1950s. They did stitch counts, they did measurements, they described um, stitch patterns that went down the back of the leg and were at the ankles. It's little stitch patterns that are called, referred to as clocks at the ankles. So I want to go to the overhead and show you what I've been working on recently that is related to Gunnister Man. What I have here are the stockings that I have knit so far, socks and stockings I've knit so far for this particular long-term project, as well as the ones in progress. So one of the challenges of doing these projects where I'm looking at the evolution of the, these types of garments. For the sweaters, I had patterns, but they were only knit in one size. And so sometimes I had to modify them a little bit to fit me, uh, and sometimes uh, quite a bit because they didn't give gauge information and the finished measurements and whatever yarn I was using, it was clear that there was a difference in row gauge. And so I would have to make adjustments. Sometimes it was pretty easy. Uh, sometimes it was not that hard. For the stocking project, the situation is a little different. So the first sock I did was that Norwegian sock that was knit by a woman born in Norway like 100 years ago. And she had this particular type. It looks like a pretty generic ribbed sock, but the technique used at the base of this heel was one I'd never seen before. And so I'm always looking for interesting techniques and unusual construction methods. And this particular sock also had some construction differences that I hadn't seen before. So I, I had an original sock, I didn't have a pattern. So I reverse engineered it and really poked at it to see and understand all of the techniques that were used in the original sock. So, so that was the challenge with the first one. The second one I knit, I went back to the 16th century and I knit a Tudor era stocking and let me get this off my shelf. I got the instructions out of this book called The Typical Tutor, written by uh, Jane Malcolm Davies and Ninja uh, Michaela. So these are academic people. They study the clothing of the Tudor era. They are experts. And so what they did was describe uh, the types of stockings that would have been used um, and what they know from extant partial stockings that still exist and that, that can be looked at. And they gave instructions for how to knit a stocking that could go up to either the thigh or just at the knee or even a little bit lower because it could have been any of those in that era. Men would have had things that went all the way up. Um, and so how you take the measurements at different places, how you, you know, calculate the shaping rate to get from, you know, something that's this circumference to that circumference. Um, and and then some information on how to work this kind of really unusual heel and unusual toe. So this was really interesting because it was a construction that I hadn't done before and the heel was crazy different, but I really had to create my own pattern based on my measurements because I wanted to see if this construction would actually fit me because I have weird fit issues with socks and I usually have to modify them and I was pretty convinced this wouldn't fit me, but because of the other 
uh, things like gauge and construction attributes, it ended up actually working and it was very surprising. So I learned a lot from this stocking. So this was this is this the next stocking I knit. It's an infant stocking. It's um, a replica of the oldest known stocking found is extant stocking in Europe. It's an infant stocking found in a canal in the Netherlands. And so this one had a, had a similar but different type of heel and the sock was knit toe up, which I thought was interesting. There was a pattern, the woman who had reverse engineered the original wrote it in Dutch and then this was an English translation and there was a few things that were a little bit confusing, but there more or less there was a pattern <laughs> for this particular one. So when it came to Gunnister, you know, there's never written patterns for these things because that's not how people knit stockings. They were taught how to knit them uh, and they knit things repeatedly the same way, especially if they were more common people, common knitters. You either have to reverse engineer it yourself, like if you physically have it or if somebody has had it physically and can poke at it and figure it out and then they write it up and then you can follow those directions. Um, or you can go based on you know things in museums so that you can't actually touch. You can look at, maybe you have a photograph, but you can't really poke at it. You can only look at it maybe from one side or one view. So the Gunnister Man, we have a description of it that was written in the 1950s and, and explains you know how many stitches there were what the gauge was how many uh, rows something was done like for the garter stitch um, band here how many rows of garter stitch uh, what the distance was um, between here and here and you know how many decreases there were so you can calculate what the stitch counts could be at any given point um, so we have a pretty detailed description. Now there are a few things in that description that are a little confusing. My original plan was to use the pattern that had been published in Piecework Magazine. I think it was in like 2011, somewhere around there. And there, there had it, this would have been short, around the same time or shortly after additional research had been done on the Gunnister clothing where they analyzed the wool and looked at how many plies and and figured out where this wool might have come from was it Shetland wool or was it from somewhere else uh, and they really worked at replicating that yarn and then remaking everything and then comparing it to the originals to see if they got it right well the article in piecework was based not on that research, but based on the article that was the description that was published in the 1950s. And so because there were a few discrepancies in that description, um, there was, you know, is open to interpretation. And I found that my interpretation did not agree with the interpretation that was published in piecework. And so I decided not to use the piecework pattern, but I did go ahead and order the yarn that was listed because even though it's been more than 10 years, that yarn is still in production. And I thought, well, that makes that easy. I don't have to hunt down something that's the right color or the right yarn weight or whatever. Uh, and so I ordered that yarn and I started the stocking. This is the original uh, one that I started using this yarn. I realized soon after casting on that this was a woolen spun yarn, not a worsted spun yarn, which means it's a stickier yarn. And for me, my experience with woolen spun yarns is that in order to knit them at the same gauge as a as a, wool, a worsted spun that's the same yarn weight, I usually have to go down a lower, smaller needle sizes because the yarn is stickier. And so in order you know, to fight against that, I need to use a smaller needle. Um, and because the yarn is sticky, it's just not as fast to knit with at these firmer gauges. Uh, the great thing about wool and spun yarn is that you can knit it at a looser gauge and it will hold itself together. Um, but that's not what I wanted for this uh, stocking. And I got, so this is the thigh and there's decreases down to the back of the knee and I was doing the increases and I just was getting fed up with it. I was kind of bored with it because it was taking long and you know, it's a boring color to begin with. I was just annoyed by the stickiness and I was rereading either the original article or the research that was done uh, back in the early 2000s and I saw that the original stockings had been knit with worsted spun yarn. 
And so this wasn't even the kind of yarn that would have been used to knit the original stocking. So then I'm like, okay, that's it. <laughs> I'm not enjoying this. I can't even see myself finishing this with this yarn. So I thought I'm going to have to find some worsted spun yarn. And so on my birthday, which was just two weeks ago, I always like to go buy myself some yarn. And I decided to go to a yarn shop I hadn't been to previously. And I knew that I wanted to buy some replacement yarn for the Gunnister stocking for sure. And maybe buy some other yarn too. So I just got a good look at that yarn shop. And I was looking at the yarns. Most of them were like regular sock yarns. They were super wash wool with nylon. I really didn't want a super wash wool. I, I, I kind of wanted something that would be more like what would have been used. Since I wasn't going to use this, this yarn, which wasn't original, if I was going to reject that for not being original, I wanted something that was closer to original. And they actually had a, a two-ply worsted spun yarn in a fingering weight is like perfect and it's so close to the same original color as well and so I started working on it just a couple of days ago I had been working on my breed study and and some other things that was that were going on and so I decided to uh to cast on for this and it's just flying because it's just so easy to knit. So I got to just about the same point that I was at before, maybe even a little bit further, and it's just going really, really fast. So I'm really happy that I stopped working with the with the uh, wool and spun yarn, and I decided to get the, the worsted spun instead. I think I am going to still refer to the Piecework Magazine uh, article for the design that goes down at the ankle right above the ankle it those are called clocks they would have like it's a little texture pattern that the stocking has it's one of the reasons i wanted to do it and uh, she i don't know if she charted it out i think she may have charted it out and i thought well she's already done that uh, i don't have to try to interpret it um, from the descriptions um, but otherwise i'm following exactly the original description not the pattern that was in piecework and I won't be doing a foot like the one in the, the Piecework magazine. I think it's it's aimed at people who want to make replicas, but maybe are also reenactors. So if you were doing a reenactment, you might want a, you're going to want a sock heel that's going to be more durable. You're going to make a toe that you're used to. No one's going to see the foot when you're doing your reenactment. Um, but I actually, in my, in for, for my purposes, I want in this case, a yarn that was more similar, uh, and I want to use a heel and a foot that would have been more similar. We don't know what the original foot looked like of Gunnister Man's stocking because they had worn out and he had sewn on like rags and like other bits of other stockings in order to create a foot <laughs> on his stocking. So we don't know what the original knitted a foot looked like, but I can guess what it would look like based on what is known about other extant stock, stocking heels from the time. So I just want to show you this. It's, it might take me another couple of weeks of working on it now and then um, in between my breed study in order to finish it, but it's going so much faster. And then once I get down to the foot, it'll just be like knitting any sock foot. This this is a lot, a lot, a lot longer. It's a lot more knitting than knitting a sock. So as you can imagine, this sort of stocking takes a lot longer to knit than just a sock would. And I'm only knitting one because the whole goal is to learn something new and the second one isn't going to teach me anything. And particularly with the Gunnister Man stockings, I just don't have a need for a pair of stockings that, uh, knit to fit a, a large-ish man. Um, so I will be only knitting one of them. So it shouldn't be uh, too long. I'm, I don't have to worry about second sock syndrome or a second stocking syndrome. So the past few weeks, I have been showing you the squares I'm knitting up from different wool breeds. I, a year, year and a half ago, I was spinning up a sampler pack of 30 different wool breeds that I'd gotten off Etsy. And just so that I could practice my spinning and, and practice spinning with a different uh, types of wool and get a sense of, of the range of wool types that there were available and just practice spinning and adjusting my spinning based on how the wool was behaving. So I did all that and then I didn't know what I wanted to do with them. And eventually what I decided to do was to just create six inch squares uh, from each of the 
of the yarns and put them all together in kind of, it'll end up being about the size of a lap blanket. And then in the future, as I acquire other wool from different breeds, I can always knit up another square and add to that. And then I'll be labeling the backs of the squares with the breed information on it so that I can um, know which square is which. This week I did the Dorset Horn, then the Cheviot, Gotland, Texel, and Rambouillet. So those are the five types of wool breeds that I will be showing you today. So let's go to the overhead. So right now I am on week four of my breed study in terms of knitting squares. I'm, I'm trying to do like five, at least five per week. Uh, I actually have these five knit already, but I just wash them and they're still wet. So you'll see those next week. One of the things that I have to do before I knit these swatches up is I have to take a look at the particular yarn that I spun and figure out what the yarn weight is so then I can figure out what needle size. At the very beginning, you know, a few weeks back, I was talking about how you can use the idea of wraps per inch and I was using a ruler. And you know, somebody mentioned in the comments, oh, you can use a spinner's tool. And, and I was trying to explain that when I was demonstrating with the ruler that the, you can get something that's got like sides, like an edge that comes up so that you can really make sure that you are inside. So uh, this is what that kind of device is so that you can uh, wrap the yarn around. This is two inches wide. You wrap it around till it fills up the two inches and then you can divide um, by two to figure out what the wraps per inch is. Um, but this particular tool also has, I don't know if you can see from the angle, these grooves right here. So you can lay the yarn in it. If you've spun pretty evenly, then this could be really useful. But if I were to lay my thick part in there, uh, it might look like it's closer to bulky. Uh, if I laid the thin part in along in here, it might look something closer to like a DK weight. So these wraps per inch correlate to a yarn weight. And so that gives you an approximate idea, but I still do the, the full wrap and then I, I verify what, what that is. So uh, my spinning on this one was, uh, this first one was so-so. So this is the Dorset Horn. It knit up nicely. That's one thing is it can be slightly, you know, thick and thin and still knit up fairly well. So this really acts like what I call like a nice wool. I could see knitting a sweater with something like this. It wouldn't necessarily be something, let me feel it. Actually, it's not bad against my neck either. It's a nice yarn. I'd consider using this um, to, knit, to knit just about any kind of garment. My notes on here says nice to knit with. So, um, so that was a good one. So Dorset Horn, I like this one. This one is called uh, Cheviot or some people call it Cheviot or if you're in New Zealand, Cheviot. <laughs> my notes said that the yarn is lumpy doesn't look too bad actually. I don't know why I thought the yarn was lumpy. This actually looks better than the yarn I spun with the Dorset Horn. But again, this is, um, I'm feeling it against my neck. It's a little, little slightly scratchy against my neck. So I might reserve something like this for a, you know, a sweater that I'm going to wear over a shirt. So I always wear a shirt under my sweaters, but some people don't. So um, when I say I would, wear, I would make a sweater out of this, I am going to wear a shirt under it. This one is um, Gotland, and this is the natural color of, of the sheep. This was very nice. In some ways, it almost feels like there's, it's just got this, it's uh, slightly hairy. There's, a, there's a, maybe a little bit of Kemp in it. But there's something both hairy but silky about it. And I, I see on my card that it had a six inch staple. So the length, the staple length was this long. So this is a longer wool, apparently. <laughs> but it knit it up really nicely. So this is a sheep that I, th I think it's, 
is it Swedish? Uh, I'll put on the screen where it's from. I'll also put pictures of, of the sheep on the screen this time. But I really liked this. So, so this is a, a really interesting natural color um, wool, a nice dark gray. I really like this uh, dark gray color quite a bit. I could see knitting something with this natural color that I would uh, enjoy wearing. And again, I would use it for something like a sweater where I'd wear a shirt underneath it. This next one was Texel, and I, you know, it looks fine. Um, my spinning was probably a little less even in this one because my knitted fabric is a little bit less even. I, I just don't think I loved it at all. And then I looked up the pictures of the sheep and I was like, oh, I don't even like the sheep. Most sheep I think are cute. I, I just, there's nothing like horrible about it. Like there's some yarns I absolutely like. There's no way I'd ever knit with this. I just, it was sort of like, why would I knit with this if I could knit with something, you know, any one of these other three. So I wasn't a fan. I'd be curious if some of you who have knit with, who have spun Texel or maybe knit with it, uh, what you thought of, uh, what you thought of it. Um, it wasn't my favorite. This one was Rambouillet. So Rambouillet is also known as of as French Merino. So the history of these sheep is that when they were the, the breed was being developed in Spain, there was a law that they could not be exported because it was like a really sought after wool. Like you couldn't export the sheep. It was very fine. And then I think it was it was the king of Spain, whoever was king of Spain at the time, he had a cousin in France and he sent a couple hundred merino sheep to France. And then they started breeding them together with some sort of an um, of English long wool sheep. And then the Rambouillet, you know, was eventually exported to what became, you know, later is the United States and also Australia. It, it's, it's, just like merino or I actually kind of like this better. I think so much of the merino I come across these days is super washed, which I don't really care for. I have knit with Rambouillet before. I have a friend with a sheep farm and she raises Rambouillet sheep. And I remember knitting with some of her yarn that she had spun up and I loved it. And what's interesting about this, this is, you know, much finer than the weight, the yarn weight that I was able to spin was much finer and was easy to spin. It was really enjoyable. I have been winding up the leftovers on my little nitty knotty and making tiny mini skeins of the leftovers. I had so much yardage left over that I had to use my regular size nitty knotty to rewind the yarn. This is my leftovers <laughs> of the Rambouillet because I just had so much yardage out of the one ounce. It's a really nice yarn. It was really nice to knit with. And I think even though it's con it's like, it's the French Merino, I just prefer this, I think, over regular Merino. I'd be curious if, if anyone else who has knit with, with Rambouillet feels the same way or if you kind of feel like they're interchangeable. But I really enjoyed the spinning process. Uh, I wrote on my card, easy to spin, similar, but somehow different to pull worth. Rambouillet. Uh, I'm a fan. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.